are on a journey. Uh, we're going to be looking at scripture. Very often it'll be going to be small texts of scripture, verses and sometimes parts of verses. And uh, we're going to learn to read it more responsibly. That is our uh, goal. How to be more responsible with scripture. And uh, I've put it in a, using a certain analogy and you'll figure it out very soon. Uh, a, B, C and D of scripture. All right. And uh, that's just one way of putting it. It's not the only way. Uh, I'm also not going to be too technical. Meaning, you know, in the field of biblical interpretation, uh, if you're in a seminary class, there are words that are used often. And I know those words, but I don't intend to use those words just because so that we make it for all people. And so this will be like 101, okay, biblical interpretation 101. Um, and uh, maybe later on, if you want to, we will have something uh, different. So welcome to our session here. So the first thing we're going to talk about is that our goal is to arrive at the basic principle of interpreting the Bible. So we are looking at the basic principle of interpretation. And what I believe is that if we read the scripture carefully, I want us to gain a confidence that if we read scripture carefully, we will understand the scripture. And uh, there is a life-giving message of scripture that we will get it if we read it carefully. So that's my basic understanding. And so we're going to look at um, what is uh, something that we need to really get to know the genres of scripture. We're going to discover that scripture has different genres, all right? Uh, and uh, there are different types of writing. We're going to grapple with some of these questions as uh, we go along, as we seek to understand the teachings of the Bible, all right? So this is our goal, to recognize that there are different, this is a big word that we need to understand when we come to the Bible, genres, okay? If you have studied literature, you are familiar with this, writings of different types. So even though you and I carry a Bible and we call it the Bible, the meaning of the word Bible, the book. Actually, it is not a book. And that's what we will learn. It has got a collection of all kinds of writing. And so we come to the to the next point, A, B, C, D. That's what we are going to learn today. A, B, C, and D. And that's uh, uh, what does that mean? So I have a question for you now. When we look at scripture and interpretation, there is something we begin with, I would call it the good news. And this is really good news. And uh, that's the foundation of this class, beginning with this good news. What is the good news about interpretation? The good news is that all of us know how to interpret scripture. All of us know how to interpret. Let's give that girl a name, Anita. All right. When Anita is six years old, mother calls her Anita. She knows why mommy is calling her because it's lunchtime. And she was playing. Mommy told her, I'll call you when it's lunchtime. And now when she calls her Anita, she knows exactly why mother is calling her. But there are other times when she calls, mother calls, Anita. And Anita knows exactly what mother means by that, right? So interpretation is not something you're going to learn today. We have learned it as babies. It's part of human life. We interpret everybody. Even a newborn baby, you look at the baby and you smile. The baby looks at you, smiles back, right? The baby is interpreting. So we know interpretation. That's good news. Start with that. It's not a new skill I'm going to teach you. You already know how to interpret. Then why this class? Well, this is where we come to the bad news. And what is the bad news? In your notes, I have given you those uh, 
images. The bad news is that many times we don't get it right. That our interpretations of the Bible, not just the Bible, of many things in life, and you'll know it if you're married for a while, you'll know that your interpretations are not right all the time. Your spouse will be ready to tell you that. So in other words, we know how to interpret, and yet, we don't get it right always. And especially if there are so many different interpretations of the same text and applications, then can all of us be right? Very often we have opposing ideas, right? And uh, so what do we do? Uh, I have given you information about um, documentary in your notes, as you can see, um, that I would recommend that you watch when you have the time. It's a documentary about um, a cult that came. By the way, did you notice on the screen that there was a person who calculated that the end of the world is going to be May 21st, 2011. That was 12 years ago the world ended, according to that. <laughs> and they spent literally millions of dollars to tell the world. I remember seeing a poster in Bangalore. Now, how did this brother, Harold Camping, come up with this? Watch that documentary, Extreme Cults, The End of the World, that did not happen. So, basically, and by the way, he was an intelligent man. He was a civil engineer. So he's not an uneducated person who's handling the Bible. Many times, the Bible is handled by godly people, good people. It's not that they are ungodly. They're good people and get it wrong. Question is, why? Intelligent people? You see in that uh, uh, slide there is one book, 88 Reasons. It's there in your notes. 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. <laughs> it happened, okay? Now this was done by a very intelligent man. Edgar Wisenant was a NASA engineer. Maybe more intelligent than most of us here. But he got it wrong. He gave you how many reasons? 88 reasons. That means not even one of them was right. Correct? If there was one of them was right, then it would have happened, right? He gave you 88 reasons. That means 88 reasons were wrong. How can an intelligent man make such a blunder? That's a good question. And it's not a difficult answer, by the way. None of the things, what we're going to learn today, nothing is difficult. The difficulty will be because if we have already have developed a certain view about something and you have an opposing view, it's always difficult. If in that movie, in that documentary, please watch that carefully, you'll read about what is called dissonance theory. What is dissonance theory? When all the while I believe something, and then you give me evidence against that, I don't want to accept it till I am faced with the reality. Something is wrong here. That's a dissonance. Right? So if I have been waiting for May 21st, 2011, for the end of the world, and you're waiting, 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 and nothing is happening, what happens on May 22nd? It's very painful. And if you watch that documentary, terrible things happened. So, you and I struggle with, once we have a certain view about something, it's not always easy to unlearn. But what is our calling in life? I want you to look at Mark chapter 6 and verse 34. Mark 6, 34. Would one of you read that? Especially if you have a desire to learn and teach. Jesus saw a great multitude, was moved with compassion for them. Because they were like sheep, were like sheep without, a without a shepherd. By the way, shepherd, that's the word pastor. The pastor means shepherd, right? And so sheep without a shepherd means a congregation without a good pastor. And so what did Jesus do? He began to teach them what? Many things. If you are a leader, Sunday school teacher, preacher, whatever your calling is, 
we need to learn so that we can teach what? Many things. But to teach many things, not the same thing, but to teach many things, you are required to learn many things. <gasps> and the challenge often is we also have to unlearn some things along the way. And that is not comfortable. To unlearn, to say, I was wrong, is not easy. Another thing to know, okay, you were wrong, but why were you wrong? Now, in this documentary that you will watch, you will see these people, obviously, on May 22nd, they realize something is wrong. But Harold Camping said, no, wait, 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 I think I got a little miscalculation. So he came up with October 21st. And then October 21st came and went. By that time, you can imagine, intelligent people, you know, young people studying in college and all, they bought into this. But they don't go the next step and say, why were we wrong? That they didn't understand. Why is it you got it wrong? And that we need to learn, okay? So our task, that is my dear friend, Pastor Laji Paul on the screen, uh, a wonderful teacher and uh, servant of the Lord in North India. Uh, basically, we are called to learn. What did Jesus tell us? Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. Come to me, all who are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. How does that rest come? He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So as we follow Jesus, we have to learn from Jesus. But as we learn from Jesus, we will also have to unlearn a lot of things. Just read through the Gospels and see the disciples struggling with Jesus. In one place in Mark chapter 8, Peter cannot take what Jesus is saying. He says, excuse me, Jesus. He takes him aside and Peter rebukes Jesus. Why? Because what Jesus is saying is too much for him to take. Jesus must be wrong. And then you read that passage in Mark 8. Jesus turns around, looks at all his disciples and then rebukes Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Oh, just before this, he had said, you are the Messiah. Peter got that right. But what did he get wrong? He got wrong. The view, his view of the Messiah was totally wrong. Not what Jesus was wanting to teach them. Correct? So following Jesus is a path of learning, but often painful unlearning. What if I have invested all my life on saying everything goes May 21st and then discover it's not? Hmm, that's tough as painful. So that's why we take time to learn responsible biblical interpretation. I don't know since we are just now, this is what has happened a few months ago in Kenya. Did you read about a cult in Kenya that misused the scriptures? A man called Paul McKenzie who was teaching a group of people and, you know, when you say something spectacular, there are always a group of people who will be around you. And please understand, they're all intelligent people. And once intelligent people believe something, they go down a certain path. It's very difficult to change that. And what happened? He convinced them to fast because Jesus is coming now and basically using certain ways of looking at the book of Revelation. And hundreds of dead bodies have been found of children, women, and men. Horrible. Just you Google Kenya cult and you'll find it. So this is obviously, there are many, many cases of irresponsible uses of scripture. Some resulting in this kind of end of death. So we thought the Bible is a book that brings life, correct? How is it bringing the Bible is not responsible for that. It's our bad, irresponsible interpretation. So we are learning to. Uh, and so today, honestly, there will be only one main takeaway, and you will see what that is. When we read the Bible, how to recognize that one important thing with the Bible. So let's start. Okay? Um, how do we begin? So I'm going to do a group exercise. Uh, let's see how much we can go for a while and then take a break and come back again. Uh, I'm going to just, uh, is right there in your notes, one, two, three, four, we'll follow one by one. <clears throat> 
and uh, I'm going to turn to any of you to give an answer, and um, and you just give me an answer. Don't think too much, okay? Just give. Uh, I say, be like Peter. Speak first, think later. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Are you ready? Are you ready? So let's begin with you. Number one, can you read that? I can. I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. Yeah. So, what does it mean? We have songs who say, "I can do everything," right? Right. What does that mean? I can do all things. What does it mean? Okay. Let's go to the next one. What's the next one? Okay. This is the tricky one. Let's go to that. So. Why don't you try, sister? Give me, a, just look at that text. This calls for wisdom. Yes. Let those who have wisdom calculate the number of the beast. You see that number on the beast there on the screen? Yeah. Who is this or what is this beast? Who is this beast? But you have not heard preachers tell you who the Antichrist is or who the beast is? Recently it was Elon Musk. Recently it was Elon Musk, poor guy. He's an interesting character. Uh, but Elon Musk, good, good, good intervention. But who is this? You've been around for a while. You've heard preachers tell you, who is this beast? Come on. Who is the, what do preachers tell? Huh? Yeah, and this Pope is such a nice man. I really like Pope Francis. And yet, there are people who will say this is about the Pope. Okay, so who is this? How do we know? Next. What's the next one? Yeah, Jesus said, John chapter 10, verse 10a, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So, sister, who's the thief? Satan. Satan, that's a good answer. Now, by the way, whenever you hear me say good answer, it means it's a good answer. <laughs> okay? And uh, along the way, we will discover maybe the right answer or a better answer. Is that okay? So, none of you will give bad answers. That's wonderful. Satan, right? That's the common way it is. But is it? Is there a mention of Satan anywhere in chapter 10? And that's a good question. We come to the next one. I'm going fast because we can have more time for questions later on. Yes. Yeah, yeah, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17. You're familiar with that verse, right? Uh, don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and uh, God dwells in you? If you destroy God's temple, God will destroy you, right? Something like that. What do you think this is referring to? Our behavior, meaning your behavior, personal behavior. Okay, so which is the temple here? Body, that's a good answer. Yes, it's the body. Okay, and we'll figure out what's the right answer soon. Okay, let's go to the next one. <laughs> Correct, that's a common one, right? So you tell me, sister, you heard this, right? When do we usually use this word, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there. We usually use it in prayer. Uh, and so what do you think it's talking about? When we gather to worship, okay? Jesus is with us. Right. That's a good answer. Okay. So, but usually we do it when about six or seven people are there. Right? When 700 people are there, we may not use this. Correct? Interesting. So what is this verse all about? Next one. Yes. Matthew 6. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and... All these, so you tell me, what, is, what do you think all refers to? All these things like, like what? In the context of it. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, what is your memory of that? What all these things mean, things like? Food, shelter and money. Money is, I mean, required for all this, but food, shelter, clothing we need. Okay, okay, good. Those are good answers. Let's go on to the next Oh, by the way, I picked up passages most of us are familiar with. Not, I don't think there'll be too many brand new passages. So, but we're going to learn something from these familiar texts. Next uh, is a very interesting phrase found in the Bible. John 10, 22, it'll say, Now the festival of dedication arrived. So, you'd like to guess what this festival of dedication is? 
Something similar to baptism? Good answer. What is your guess? Child dedication? Right. Now, this is an expected answer because that's what we are familiar with. Dedication may be in baptism. Dedication may be when a child is dedicated. And uh, in the time of Jesus, were they having baptism or child dedication like that? It's a good question. Okay, so when you're reading it, there is no explanation there, correct? And so you're not to blame for not knowing that. So let's go to the next one. Ah, this is a well-known passage. Uh, we, we say that, don't we? That Jesus said, I am the true vine and you are the branches and my father is the gardener. So it's a beautiful analogy. But why did Jesus say, I'm the true vine? Rather than say, I'm the true mango. They were in a vineyard. That's a good possibility. So, I mean, they have, people are familiar with that. So it's familiarity. Okay. But why wine? Prophecy of the shoot. Oh, you're going into Isaiah. Good. Okay. All right. Hmm. Okay. Good. Now, we are all familiar with this, correct? I am the true vine. Any, any guess you may have? Why do you think Jesus used that? Yes, and that was very common to have vine, W-I-N-E. And so, but Jesus is saying, I'm the plant, not the juice. So why is he saying that? Any guess? Source of, but that can be true of any tree. We can use that for mango. We can use all trees, the branches are connected, correct? So why specifically did Jesus use that? They grow in bunches, so we should be in bunches. We should be Churchill's. Ah, I like that analogy. Good. Okay. All right. Now we come to the well-known parable in Luke chapter 10. Don't we know this parable? Very well. So what do you think, uh, my brother, what do you think is the main point of this parable? You know this parable. Be a good neighbor. Be a good neighbor to whom? Person in need. Yeah. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Yeah. That's how many, uh, many couples have been formed. <laughs> Even if you're an enemy. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Love your neighbor. Okay. I remember learning this in Sunday school and I think sometimes a uh, teacher would say something like, now children, at least go and help your mommy in the kitchen, you know. <laughs> okay. So what is this parable all about? It's a well-known parable of Jesus. We call it, it has not we call it, it has been traditionally called the parable of the Good Samaritan. Just remind yourself, all these titles to sections of the Bible and parables were given traditionally later on. Not by Jesus, not by the author. Okay, just remember that. So when you read that in your Bible, that's not part of the original writing. Just remind yourself that. Headings and things uh, like that. Okay, now we come to another interesting section. The pig. Leviticus 11.7, correct? And not just that. You're not supposed to eat this meat of this animal, but there are many things in the laws of the Old Testament you're not supposed to have, like crabs, prawns, all that very clearly is found in those laws. So, what do we do with those laws? Can Christians eat pork? Yes. It's in the Old Testament, so we don't follow what is there in the Old Testament. Do you know of Christians who don't eat pork? Yeah. Or crabs or certain kind of fish, all that is there. What do we do with these kind of laws? It's there in your Bible, right? Especially if we just pull out verses from here and there. There are many such verses. What do we do with them? All right, the next one is about, it's from the book of Proverbs. Nice to pull out something from Proverbs. So it says, do not move an ancient boundary stone set up by your forefathers. So brother, what do you think we should do with that verse? 
keep the laws. What kind of laws? Moses' laws, forefathers. So basically what you're saying is the stone is a metaphor for commandments or laws or some may say traditions that we have for our forefathers. So if I'm part of a church tradition, then my forefathers, whatever traditions, we should follow that, correct? So it's similar to that. Good, let's go on to the next uh, verse and that is, um, hmm, can Christian women, Deuteronomy 22 verse 5 is very clear. Man shall not wear women's clothing. Women shall not wear man's clothing. For the Lord your God detests. It's a very strong word. This says that. So, what do we do? Can Christian women today wear trousers? I like to have a... A lady speak. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. What do we do with this verse? Oh, so you come to New Testament. <laughs> New Testament comes to your rescue, okay? We should dress modestly. Have you heard Christian leaders sometimes say women should not wear, especially not to church? Yeah? Yeah? So we have that uh, teaching. So what do we do with verses like this? We go to the next one. And the next one is very interesting. It's from the same chapter. By the way, there's a list of all kinds of laws. Deuteronomy 22. We are still in Deuteronomy 22. Verses 9 to 11. There are three kinds of laws there. Three laws similar. One, it says, do not mix two kinds of seeds, grape seeds. There are all kinds of seeds, as you can see in the slide. Grapes are very many varieties. So don't mix them, number one. Secondly, it will say, don't mix two kinds of fabric. Wool and linen, don't mix them. Thirdly, it will say, if you are plowing your field, don't plow with what you see there. Ah, ox and a donkey. Why? You can give me the reason. Why? why what do you think? It should not corrupt, okay? Uh, okay, it should not corrupt. If I only have an ox and I only have one donkey, I have to plow my field. Can I do it or not? According to this law. Should not do it. So I should be hungry. I can't do this. I, I can't plow my field. Why does God ask? By the way, did you notice all those three laws are the same point in different places, correct? Don't mix things. Don't mix two kinds of seeds in the same garden. Don't... Uh, Wear clothing of mixed clothing, mixed fabric. Correct? Why these laws? It's in your Bible. Huh? Yeah. Logically, but you know, today most of the clothing we are wearing in our wardrobes are mixed. Yeah. So what is this whole thing about? Is it simple logic? You know, we can say, oh, the farmer, uh, you know, don't put uh, two kinds of animals. The farmer knows that. You don't tell people not to do something which they are not prone to do or tempted to do. You don't tell most children, don't study too much. <laughs> that doesn't happen for most children. That's not a temptation to study too much. Correct? So you tell people not to do something because they may want to do it. So why... Does God have to give or does Israelites are given this law? Why? What is the point of this? All right. And um, now comes this well-known saying of Jesus. What is it? It is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter kingdom of God. So, how do you look at it? Extreme example to make them think. But is it possible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle? Yes or no? No? But have you ever heard preachers tell you that in Jerusalem there was a small gate? You heard that? In fact, you Google it, you'll find a picture 
or something called the eye of the needle gate. Only problem was it was not there in the time of Jesus. But we think there must be a small gate, a little gate, so the camel can't walk through like this. But you can mm, get the camel on the knees and somehow shove the camel through that narrow door. So like that rich man, bring them into the church, get them on their knees, make them give tithe, and then slowly we will slide them into the kingdom of God. Is this, what is this passage doing? What is Jesus saying? What is Jesus saying here? Because a camel cannot go through the eye of a needle. If that is true, then a rich man cannot. It's impossible for that to happen. And that Jesus is easier than a rich man coming into the kingdom of God. So a rich man cannot come into the kingdom of God. Some of us here are not poor. So what do we do? Next, this is a well-known story about a widow. Remember the story we learned in Sunday school? Which story is this? There are a lot of people giving gifts. Jesus is watching them. This is in the temple courts where women can come in. And Gentiles also can come in. And people are putting gifts. And Jesus is watching them giving. That's interesting, Pastor. You don't watch people what they are putting into the offering. But Jesus was. And uh, a woman came. She put in two five rupee coins, copper coins. That's all she had. And then Jesus said, she has given more than others. She has given everything she had to live on. So what do we do with this? What do you learn from this story? Yeah. Asking you. Yeah. What do you think, Jesus? So what do we do with this? So we Sunday morning, we come. We give everything in your wallet, your credit card, everything, so that you go back home without food. And if you have a family, you have to tell your children, I followed this passage, I gave everything, sorry, we have nothing for the rest of the week. What do we do with this? Do we give everything? Is that the point of this story? She gave with all heart. So we should give from, with all our heart, but we have to give everything? <laughs> Good question, right? So what do we learn about and from this passage? Okay, next one. And this one is a tricky one. <laughs> what do we do with this? Very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 to 16, Paul is very clear. He tells women in Corinth that when you gather for public worship, there should be a veil over your head. Very clear. He says, I have no other rule in all the churches. That is Paul question is now, what about us? Almost 20 centuries later. Is it a requirement, according to this text, does God want all women everywhere to have a covering over their head or a veil or whatever? In India, it can be a transparent dupatta because the hairstyle should still want to show it, right? After, after doing all that nice hairstyle, you wear something to cover it, doesn't make sense. Uh, so what is required? Does the Bible expect that for all women everywhere? Good question, correct? Let's go on. I'm going a little fast because we need to finish. What about this? What about jewelry? Now, I know in some context, this is not even a question. Christians are not bothered about this question. But you are aware that there are many contexts among good people connected, we know them in our churches, where there is a teaching that if you really want to follow Jesus, and sometimes they will insist at the time of baptism, you have to remove jewelry. And uh, that is a very clear teaching and verses like 1 Timothy 2.9 will be used. So what do we do with that? Is this something that we have to insist is biblical teaching that is no nonsense, you have to follow it? That is a question. And you're all aware 
of this question. So now I have to quickly go through some questions there. Uh, who was the wisest man in the Bible? King Solomon. King Solomon is a good answer. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, next one is, um, yes, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, what? What did he say? Broken for you, correct? Yes, good. Uh, by the way, uh, you know my name? Jacob. You know the meaning of my name? <laughs> so I'm going to be asking tricky questions, okay? <laughs> so don't be surprised. You will find I have already done that. Okay. Uh, so how old was Jesus when he began his public ministry? Huh? 30. 30 is a good answer. <laughs> okay, and um, then the last one. Jesus was born in a... He was born in Bethlehem, but he was born in a... Okay. Born in a manger. Is that what you say? All right. What we just now did was looked at several texts. I know they are disjointed texts. Some from the Old Testament some from the laws, some even one from Proverbs, uh, and then we looked at um, some things from the words of Jesus, from the parables, uh, sayings of Jesus. We even looked at a text from Revelation. Okay, so how and what do we do when we look at this scripture? So what can we learn from this? Do all our views about all these texts, are they the same? Come on. No, we do not all agree on this. Why? We often do that because we all look at texts with our own glasses. Right? So, that's why we look at texts carefully all of us have our own glasses. Uh, towards the end, I will talk about the three lenses all of us look at text through. You know, and we will talk about that at the very end. So because of that, we all come to different conclusions. Believers. It's not that one is a believer and the other is not because we have a different view, right? We are believers and we are working. All of us can believe uh, differently when we look at a text, uh, depending on where we come from, our traditions, etc. And so one person may say, this is what the Bible says. Well, there are a lot of things in the Bible that are written that we reason and say, this does not apply now for us. You know, sacrificial system in the Old Testament, right? How much of it? There are pages and pages and pages how to do sacrifices, different types of sacrifice. Do we teach that in our churches today, how to do sacrifices? No. So we look at this. So let's keep this in mind and, um, and go ahead. We will study these texts carefully. But before we do that, I want to talk about some of the most important things about the Bible, some facts and uh, realities about the Bible. A few of them that you have to keep in mind. Number one, the Bible is a library. Right? It is not a book in a sense. It is a collection of writings. And uh, therefore, we recognize there are what we call literary genres in the Bible. Different types of writing. When you're reading Psalms and when you're reading the Gospels and the book of Acts, let's say, are they the same type? No. What about Song of Songs? Very different. What about Revelation? Another type of writing. The word genre is a simple word used often in literature, but it's a type of writing. So just think of it several books in your library, what do you do when you do that? 
Do we just pull out one book, turn to page 36 here, read one line, put it back, then to turn to another book, page 100 here, and read one line, and then take another book and open it, and one more line, connect them all together. You can do that, we do it all the time, because we say it's in one book. Please remember, the fact that today you are holding a book, or I can hold a book like this, is because books are available today. In the time of Jesus, were there any books? Were all the Old Testament books together? No, there was no printing press, there was no book. So what? They had scrolls. So the scroll of Isaiah will be separate. Then the scroll of Deuteronomy will be different. You have different scrolls for centuries. They were not together yet. You know? And so the codex, the book form, is slowly coming a, few, a couple of centuries after Jesus. So when we read the Bible, remember there are literary genres and also literary devices. What is a literary device? We all use devices. We use a device for opening the house. Or today, some of us, we, in our cars, how do you open it? You just press a click and the car opens, right? And so we have different devices. The phone we use is a device. And we are used to that, but the same thing you can do with language. You have literary devices, many. Simile, what is a simile? A is like B. You have metaphor, what is metaphor? A is B. So when Jesus said, I am the true vine, He's using a metaphor. But everybody understands Jesus is not a plant. But he's making a point. Right? There is something called hyperbole. What is hyperbole? Exaggeration. Exaggeration. You tell somebody, Are in a thousand years, you cannot do this. Nobody's living till thousand. But that's language. So keep in mind when you're reading, writing. Bible is ultimately writing. And in writing, we use different types of writings and different devices to express things. There are many, 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 many ways of saying that. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. When you read the Bible, you're reading different types of genres. And therefore, think of genres like a different game. The same games field, you can have hockey and you can have football. Do you play with the same rules? No way. Okay, so you can play volleyball in the field, you can play basketball in the same field. Do you play with the same rules? No. So when you read the Bible, the first thing you say, what kind of writing is this? What rules should I keep in mind? Right? And otherwise, we have no, you know, you come to play a game and you have your own rules, the other person has their own rules, we're going to have chaos. We can't have a game. We have to understand this reality. Number two, and this is very huge for many people. If I just asked you a question and I want you to complete for me, the Bible is, what will you say? The Bible is word of God, very good. What else? Huh? Collection of books, that's, we just now said it. But the Bible is, commonly what do we say? Holy book, word of God. Now that is right. That is a right answer, but it's incomplete. So how do we understand the Bible? This is point number two. That is, the Bible is God's word given to us in human words. That's important. God's word given to us in human words. God is not dictating here. We'll come back to that in a minute when we talk about inspiration so that we understand what is inspiration. We use the word Bible is the insp it's not like any other book. It is inspired. What do we mean by that as people who believe the Bible is the word of God? Not everybody believes that, okay, friends? So in the community of faith, we look at by the Bible in this way. That means the words are given in a particular history. So we need to keep that in mind. It's not written in 21st century language. So it will not tell you, 
can we watch television? Bible doesn't answer that question. Few years ago, not now, you know, there were preachers who preached against the television. I remember that. You know, say that is the devil's box. You know, correct? Few years later, the same preachers now preached on television. <laughs> and they say, please watch my television program. So what does the Bible talk about television? Nothing. Because there was no television at that time. So we, to find out what to do with television, we have to have some other categories. We go into a subject. And that subject is going to help us understand what to do today. Correct? So keep this in mind. The Bible is writing from a particular context. So even the latest one, the book of Revelation, most probably, is almost 2,000 years, 1,900 plus years before us. So what do we do with that? Keep in mind. Now comes another important uh, learning thing about your Bible. How many chapters does the Gospel of Luke have? Anyone? 24. How many chapters does the Gospel of Matthew have? 28. Which of them is longer? We would say Matthew, right? But just to remind yourself, these chapter divisions in your Bible came after centuries. The chapter divisions in your Bible came in the early 1200s. Early 1200s. All this, by the way, you can find online on Wikipedia. So before that, nobody had chapter this. So you say John 3.16. Everybody knows John 3.16? Yes. But John, who wrote the gospel, doesn't know it. There were no chapter divisions. You know Philippians 4.13? Good. Paul doesn't know it. There were no chapter divisions. Just remind yourself. So they are arbitrary to some extent. Hoping to be helpful, but sometimes they may be in the middle of something. So if you start reading only for what in your heading, chapter 15 and read on, there may be a connection with 14, but you don't see that. Just remind yourself. That's number one. Number two. Verses. <laughs> that's, 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 that's a very important thing. Verses. Do you get verses on WhatsApp every morning? Do you? On your WhatsApp thing? What kind of verse? Woe unto you. No, you don't get that. You say, God is with you. God bless you. Maybe what I need is a little, you know, good hit on the backside. Uh, instead of telling you God is with me. Correct? And why do we do that? These are verses. When did these verse divisions come? Paul does not know 413 because there's no chapter, there are no verses. The verse divisions came in the middle of the 16th century. 16th century. So, here we are. Right after the Reformation, Protestant Reformation, we begin to see the divisions of the verses, right? So, verses are not inspired or God chose it. It came later on, hoping to be helpful. But remember one thing, these verse divisions when they were made, some of those verse divisions do not even capture one sentence. Sometimes one long sentence is five verses. So what happens when you just take one verse? You have not even listened to the whole sentence. So my wife is saying something. She's saying something which has got four lines or four phrases or whatever. I hear the third one and I go with that. And she said, I said, I didn't hear what you said. Yeah, that's a problem. So when you read a verse, please understand you may be reading only part of a sentence. And so if we run with verses from here, there, everywhere, we then get a disease, what I've called in my notes, what did I call it? Versitis. Okay? And we all have that disease. And to illustrate that, that's why I took verses. In the beginning, the first section, we just looked at verses without context, correct? Ah. 
And so we know these verses, you know, where two or three are gathered in my name. We know these verses. But we only know verses we have not seen, we have not read the Bible. What is the solution? Read your Bible, don't read verses. Because why these chapters and verses are not original. If you just pull one verse, okay, Ecclesiastes, I recently preached here on that, uh, which is the verse we know very well from, he makes everything beautiful in his time. Very nice. Do you know that is only one third of a sentence of a verse? There's a third part to that verse. You may not like to put it on your wedding card. Same verse. It's not 311. It's 311A. There's a B and a C. Okay. Chapter 10, verse 19, Ecclesiastes. One part of it says, money is the answer for everything. So in your company, you'd say that. People will say, I agree with that. That's in the Bible. So do you just take that? and say the Bible says money is the answer for everything. So how do we look at verses? So keep this in mind. And now comes an important thing to understand about Bible translations. Bible translations are a necessity. Why? Because we don't learn Hebrew growing up, and we don't learn Greek growing up, so we cannot read the Hebrew and Greek thing. I just brought the, my Greek New Testament here. Okay, how many of us can actually learn how to read that? Few, very few, right? So we need a translation, and God wants us to have a translation. The whole world is reading the Bible in translations. But keep in mind, there are limits when you translate from one verse to the other. So sometimes when you're reading, uh, it's good if you can read in two languages, especially if you're reading in a vernacular translation. Also read a good modern English translation. Sometimes you'll see a difference. And of course, you need to learn. This may be 201 that we go to understand about Bible translations. And another matter there I mentioned is matter of manuscripts and versions. Even sometimes you will find one version of the English Bible, another version has a slightly different words used. Why is that so? And you will understand that if you realize that original, let's say in the New Testament, when is it written? First century AD, correct? And so beginning with that, all these, remember, are handwritten. You cannot take a screenshot like today you take of a document, right? And they are to be written by hand. Manuscript means written with the hand. And so when you write with the hand, the whole thing has to be written. And then copied again and again. We have thousands of manuscripts for the New Testament. More than 6,000 manuscripts of the New Testament, especially small and big. Sometimes just a little bit, sometimes a whole book, a letter, whatever. So there are many, many, many manuscripts and that's a whole world of learning. Thank God for those who struggle with manuscripts so that we have a translation. So a good committee translation and there are many good ones. Uh, and uh, maybe later on in a question answer time we can talk about what about King James, what about other modern translations and we can deal with that. So this is a reality. We are dealing with translations. And uh, so sometimes there could be differences. We need to understand why. The next thing to remember is about the word inspiration. When we talk about inspiration of the Bible, what do we mean? You say the Bible is inspired? Word of God? Now the important thing to recognize there is this is not like how some others talk about inspiration. Our brothers and sisters in another major religion of the world, their view of their book is that it was dictated by God. That's what they believe. It was dictated and it was written down. So everything is dictation. When we say the Bible is inspired, what are we saying? It is not dictation. So you will have to work very hard with your view of the Bible. 
Because we may have inherited a little bit of this idea thinking that the Bible is dictated. You know, in the Bible, the psalmist will say, oh God, you have left me. Is that a dictation? <laughs> or Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 11, now I am going to talk like a fool. Does it make sense to think of it as dictation? No. So then what do we mean, Pastor Jacob, you say? What do we mean when we say the Bible is inspired? For the people of God, that's what we believe. And the key passages, 2 Timothy 3.16. Remember John 3.16? You should also know 2 Timothy 3.16. But not only 3.16, read the verses before that also. Paul says, all scripture is, and then he uses a Greek word, theopneustos. It's there in your notes, right? What does that mean? It's a compound word, theos, God, pneustos, pneuma, breath. So he's put two words together and he has created a word called theopneustos. So some of your Bible translations will have the word God breathed. Yes? Some will have the word inspired. What does that mean? What is inspired? What is spire? Spire. Spire means breath. Okay? Spiration is breath. Now, that's why when somebody dies, we say they expired. Means the breath came out. X. Got it? So, inspire means breath came in. Whose breath? God's breath. Now, now we realize we are dealing with a metaphor. Why? Because does God have lungs? God is spirit. But we are using human language to talk about God's breath. And we are pulled right away to the first story, the second page of your Bible. What does it talk about? God breathed on the humans. And what happened? Life came to be. So, inspiration of the Bible is not referring to how the writings of the Bible got written. It's not about the process of writing. God used human beings to write everything in the Bible. No angel wrote anything in the Old or New Testaments. Psalmists, some of the Psalmists, we don't even know who they are, right? And not all Psalms are nice Psalms, okay? Okay. There are psalms when the psalmists are saying, God, you have left us. You know, darkness is my friend. Yes, that's how they feel. How wonderful that they can express that to God. So, it's not dictation. Then what is it? Well, Paul is using a metaphor to say, just like God's breath brings life, scriptures and by the way in 2 Timothy 3.16 when Paul refers to all scriptures it is not this Bible why? it is what we call Old Testament because there was no New Testament then he's referring to the Hebrew scriptures and he says they are life giving Paul as a follower of Jesus. So in other words, please understand, when you say inspiration, it's not about some magical way the Bible got written. It's written in a normal, Paul is sitting and writing to the Galatians. Now, of course, as Christians, what we do is, once the New Testament is formed, we put it together and we claim that the whole scriptures, all of it, including the writings of the New Testament, written by God's people, is inspired, meaning life-giving. So when you think of inspiration of the Bible, don't think that, so Bible, whatever it says about, you know, cosmology must be right. So don't believe what science tells you. Do you tell your child, you'll go to school, you know, in school they will tell you that the earth is going around the sun. Don't believe it. Bible says sun is going around the earth. Will you do that? I hope not. Because otherwise you have misunderstood the Bible, the purpose of the Bible. So Bible is life-giving. And that's why we use it. But let me say this, as I mentioned in the beginning. 
if we don't use the Bible responsibly, we can injure people. We can hurt people. Instead of bringing life, we may bring death.